everyone, and welcome to the Learn AI in 60 Minutes workshop hosted by AI for Anyone and Mark Cuban Foundation. We hope you're all staying safe wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Harun Chaudhry. I'm the co-founder and executive director at AI for Anyone. We're really excited to be hosting our very first virtual workshop today in partnership with Mark Cuban Foundation. For those of you that don't know, AI for Anyone is a nonprofit organization that's focused on increasing the AI literacy of our audience. Over the past three years, we've taught the fundamentals of AI to over 1,500 students in New York City. Towards the end of today's event, we're going to give you more details on how you can learn more about us and how you can get more involved. Now, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Jesse, at Mark Cuban Foundation to talk to you a little bit more about their AI boot camps. Hello, everybody. My name is Jesse Stauffer. And here at the Mark Cuban Foundation, we're hosting free boot camps on AI for high school students. During these boot camps, you'll have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about artificial intelligence, as well as build some AI applications of your own. So just stick around till the end of the stream. And if you have any interest in this, we'll show you some more information on how you can get involved. Thanks. All right, thanks, Jesse. So before we get started with the workshop, we want to walk you through the schedule of events. So what you can expect over the next 55 minutes or so. First, we're going to start off with the workshop and the workshop is going to teach you what AI is, how AI works, how we can build a better world with AI. And given the current situation with COVID-19, we'll be briefly walking through the impact of AI in COVID-19. Now, the workshop's intended for students and educators, but if you're not one of those two things, don't worry. We're still really confident that you're going to learn a lot from it. Next, we're going to have a Q&A section where we're going to be answering a few of your most pressing questions. After that, we're going to close by giving you some more information on what's happening over at AI for Anyone and Mark Cuban Foundations, how you can get involved, and a little bit more details on the follow-up email that we're going to be sending you that's going to contain a bunch of resources to expand your learning of AI and move forward from here with even more knowledge. Now, a few housekeeping items before we dive in. We're also going to be giving away a few Google AI Y kits at some point during this workshop. So we're going to give you some more details on those. Uh, these kits are awesome. They'll allow you to build a camera that recognizes objects using machine learning. They're great tools for learning AI for people of any age. And uh, we're going to be giving three of those out on behalf of AI for Anyone. So stay tuned until the end of the workshop. We'll give you instructions on how you can enter the giveaway. As a reminder, this is our first virtual workshop. And there's a lot of you on this stream. So if there's any technical issues, any technical delays, just know that we have a technical support team on the line to fix these issues. And we appreciate your patience in advance. So now let's introduce our presenters who are going to be walking you through our presentation. First, we have my co-founder and director of finance, Mac McMahon. We have co-founder and director of operations and marketing, Hamza Chaudhry. We have our director of programs, Janid Warwani. And we have our workshop facilitator volunteer, Salam Ogis. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Salam to kick off our workshop and walk you through our AI, uh, Learn AI in 60 Minutes workshop. Take it away, Salam. Hello, everyone. So I'm really excited to get started. So let's learn AI in 60 Minutes. So before we begin, I think it's important to mention that in the wake of the pandemic, despite this not being the most ideal circumstances to be in, this is still a great opportunity to learn AI. And we'll also be using Slido, which is a great interactive tool so that we can talk to you. And the first question I have is, which cities are everyone tuning in from? I'm tuning in from New York. So I see a bit of people coming in from New York as well. I also see people coming in from all across the country and even, wow, outside of the US as well. So let's begin with the learning objectives. So the first learning objective is what is AI? Can we identify it? Can we see it in action? How does AI learn? And are we able to see its pitfalls and its weaknesses? And how can we build a better world with AI? So 
So the first question I have for you guys today is how do you guys book a haircut appointment? Wow. So a lot of you are saying walk in and also online. And I do both as well. But let's look at a more novel approach to actually booking a haircut appointment. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. How oh, can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So this is an example of artificial intelligence because this is a machine actually demonstrating its form of intelligence and it's able to communicate and respond to a human ba and based off of what they're saying, respond accordingly. So let's look at another example of artificial intelligence. Teachers at this primary school in China know exactly when someone isn't paying attention. These headbands measure each student's level of concentration. The information is then directly sent to the teacher's computer and to parents. China has big plans to become a global leader in artificial intelligence. It has enabled a cashless economy where people make purchases with their faces. A giant network of surveillance cameras with facial recognition helps police monitor citizens. Meanwhile, some schools offer glimpses of what the future of high-tech education in the country might look like. Good job. Classrooms have robots that analyze students' health and engagement levels. Students wear uniforms with chips that track their locations. There are even surveillance cameras that monitor how often students check their phones or yawn during classes. These gadgets have alarmed Chinese netizens. So as you can see, this is also another form of AI because the headband is actually able to monitor and determine things such as boredom and concentration, which are normally things that humans are able to actually identify. So whether you think that the headband or even the Google tool is actually ethical or not is important, but also it's important to forward the conversation of artificial intelligence because regardless of your feelings towards it, this is our future and it's really important to talk about it. So with that being said, let's move on to what is AI. Thanks so much, Salam. Um, yeah, let's dive right into our very first learning objective. What is AI? And to talk about this, we're going to play a little bit of a game. I'm going to show you some examples, and you'll be able to hop onto Slido again and try to see whether you can identify the things that are AI and those that aren't. And the examples we're going to talk about are Siri, a microwave, Wally, -E, a self driving car, a coin sorter, Facebook auto tag, and Terminator. So pull out your phones. You can head over to slido.com and enter the hashtag on the side p593 
and you can try to check all the examples of AI. And I'll give you a few seconds to do this. Cool, and we'll see how you guys are doing. So it seems like most of you think that self-driving cars, Siri, Facebook Auto Tag, Wally, and Terminator are examples of AI. And most of you are pretty sure that coin servers and microwaves are not. And guess what? You guys are actually pretty bang on. Um, and one way to kind of think about this is that you know, with a microwave, for example, you're generally, when you're using a microwave, you're telling it exactly how to do what it is doing. You're not asking a chef to prepare a meal. Instead, you're telling the microwave you know, I'm going to put this frozen, frozen pizza inside it and then turn it on for exactly five minutes. The microwave isn't doing anything that we would consider to be intelligent, um, nor is the coin sorter. The coin sorter is simply weighing a coin and then putting it into a different bucket. And we're telling it exactly what to look for. Um, and so in these cases, neither of these are doing things that we would consider intelligent. Now, you know, examples are great, but let's get a little bit more technical about this. And if you were to look up a definition of artificial intelligence, this is one that you might come across. That artificial intelligence is computer systems doing things that normally need human intelligence. What do we mean by computer systems? These are things like your laptop, um, your smartphone is a really great example. And when they're doing things that normally need human intelligence, these are things like writing a poem or um, giving a lecture to a classroom um, these are things that we normally require human intelligence to do. But there's this really weird word in here that makes the definition a little bit vague. Normally. Why normally, right? What happens when it becomes normal for computers to do something? And I'll give you a really good example of this. Um, the first time that we had a computer system um, play chess and beat the world's leading expert at that time at a game of chess. Um, that was when uh, Deep Blue was able to play against Gary Kasparov. We looked at that and we thought, wow, that was like really smart. This thing is intelligent. And however, as we started to learn about how that algorithm actually worked, we realized that what it was doing was simply at every given point, it was calculating all the possible moves it could make and then seeing which one seemed more likely for it to actually um, win the game. And so as we started to understand that, we started thinking maybe this actually isn't intelligent the way that we deem humans to be intelligent. And you know, if you compare this to, for example, a baby learning, we still think of babies learning as being pretty magical, right? And this is this phenomenon is generally referred to as the AI effect, when things stop being magical. When Deep Blue first beat Kerry Gasparov at a game of chess, we thought that was AI. Nowadays, a lot of experts and a lot of people in the public domain don't actually refer to that as AI. Um, so this AI effect is when things stop being kind of magical. And what this effectively means is that, you know, the things that we consider to be AI today in 10 years may actually not be considered AI anymore, which makes defining AI all the more difficult. But let's look at examples of actual AI. And AI is generally broken up into two categories. The first category is artificial narrow intelligence, or ANI. This is when AI is as magical as human intelligence at one thing, ANI, or artificial narrow intelligence. Whereas when it's as magical as human intelligence at everything, you have AGI, artificial general intelligence. And We'll go back to our little bit of uh, our game. Uh, we looked at some examples of AI previously, and we'll go back to those and we'll help with just that information. Let's see if you guys can figure out which of these are examples of ANI and which of these are examples of AGI. And the examples of AI that we had again were Siri, Wally, -E, a driverless car, Facebook auto tag, and Terminator. So go ahead and whip out your phones and see if you can figure out which of these are examples of ANI or artificial narrow intelligence. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. For those of you that are just joining in, if you want to participate in these, you just head over to slido.com, enter that hashtag P593, 
and you should be able to participate in some of our live polls and quizzes. Let's take a look at what you guys think. It seems like most of you think that Facebook auto tag and self-driving cars are examples of ANI, and you're actually absolutely correct. And most of you think that Wally -E and Terminator are examples of AGI, and again, you're correct. But you seem to be pretty torn on Siri, which is interesting. And Siri is actually not an example of AGI. It's an example of ANI. And a good sort of way to think about this, right, is that Siri can't do what Facebook auto tag does. It can't pick out a face from a photo. Siri also can't be put behind a car and told to drive. It'll just not be able to do anything. Whereas in general, a human will be able to do these things. Then that's one way that we can figure out whether something is ANI or AGI. Let's go into an actual direct comparison of these two. And as we saw, ANI is generally good at one thing, and AGI is good at everything a human can do. Theoretically, when we have AGI, we actually should not be able to tell whether this is something that's artificial or something that's completely human. Both of these do learn from examples, but AGI is able to take skills that it's learned and transfer them to completely new areas that it's never seen before similar to what a human can do. And finally, ANI does exist today, and AGI actually does not exist, and we don't even know if it ever will. And this is probably the biggest giveaway about whether something is ANI or AGI. There are a lot of scientists that are currently working on trying to figure out AGI and trying to build it and seeing if it is actually possible, but we don't know if it is. There are definitely a lot of smart people trying to work on this, though. And with that, let's move on to our second learning objective. How does AI learn? And to understand this, we'll think about first what a regular computer program does. A computer program is generally, you know, you give the computer a set of instructions and it just follows those instructions. So for example, if I were to write a computer program that's trying to figure out whether a given image is an image of a tiger, I might write this computer program to first check whether the image has four legs. And yeah, this type, this photo over here does have four legs. Does it have a tail? Yep, we see a tail over there too. Does it have two ears that stick up in the air? And yep, we've got those too. Does it have whiskers? Checkbox. And finally, probably the biggest giveaway for a tiger, does it have black and orange stripes? Yep, it's got those too. Congratulations, you found a tiger. But let's take a look at a second image, right? And with this image, we've also got something that has four legs. And it also has a tail. Yeah, it's also got two ears that stick up. And it has whiskers. And it kind of does have black and orange stripes. So your computer program might come back and tell you that, yes, this is a tiger. Whereas anyone from a two-year-old up could look at that and be like, no, that's not a tiger. That's definitely a cat. So how are we actually going to have AI learn? How are we going to get it to get better? And to understand this, we sent out a game to you earlier on um, that many of you got to play. And for those that didn't, I'll explain the game to you just so you get caught up. Um, in this game, we told you that there's this make-believe world where there are these things called Digicons. And there's specifically three types of Digicons. There's Yodas, there's Fluffers, and there's Skizzles. And then we gave you examples of Digicons, and we asked you to guess, do you think this is a Yoda, a Fluffer, or a Skizzle? And after you guessed, we told you whether your guess was correct or whether your guess was incorrect. And over time, we gave you example upon example, and you were able to get feedback and feedback um, to see if you were actually able to do better. So you know, to illustrate this more for you, we first gave you this shape, and we asked you to guess what it was, and you might have said, ah, maybe it's a fluffer, and we would have told you, actually, no, this was a Yoda. And then we'd show you a second shape, and you'd say, maybe this is a skizzle, and turns out you're right, it definitely is a skizzle. Then we show you a third shape, and you say, this maybe is a fluffer. Turns out it's actually also a skizzle. And we gave you another shape that was a Yoda, and we gave you another shape. And so we kept giving you examples and examples and giving you feedback on your guesses. And then afterwards, we looked at the scores that you guys had. And specifically, we looked at the score you had for the first four questions you saw and the scores for the last four questions you saw. And there's something really interesting here. The first four questions, you scored an average of 45%. The last four questions, you scored an average of 78%. 
right? He went from a failing grade to a B plus. And all of this without having any context of what a Digicon is or what a Fluffer or a, or a, or a Yoda is. And that's similar to how an AI is actually going to learn, is it's going to get examples and it's going to get feedback on its guesses for those examples. And over time, it's able to pick out what are the traits that are going to distinguish a Yoda from a Fluffer from a Skizzle. Now, if we were to actually build this as a regular computer program, you'd probably tell me that it's actually not that hard, right? You'd say that anything that's triangle, a triangle is a schizzle, anything that's got a red outline is a fluffer, and everything else is a Yoda. And you'd be able to pick that out pretty easily. But what if there were 10 different types of Digicons? Or what if there were 100 types or 1,000 types? All of a sudden, it becomes really, really difficult to do this with a regular computer program, right? Or what about if it was just really hard to define the differences that you're looking for, right? How would you tell me the difference between two people's faces? It'd be really hard to actually verbalize. In fact, if I asked two different people, they might give me two different, completely different answers about how Mark Wahlberg's face and Matt Damon's faces are different. And that's ultimately what we see is that when we have complicated rules, describing those rules to a computer is really hard. And often even figuring out what those rules can be can also be really hard. And that's why AI learns through examples and lots of repetition. Similar to how you were able to learn the differences between Digicons, AI is able to learn those same differences, but at a much larger scale. And so coming back to our computer program, if we were to build this out, right, we would give our computer program lots of examples of tigers and say, these are tigers, and give it lots of examples of things that are not tigers, like sloths and zebras, and tell it that these are not tigers. And then we'd also be careful to make sure that we give it all of the edge cases, the things that are like maybe close to a tiger, but not actually. So things like a cat or a leopard or a lion. Now this approach does have its pitfalls that we have to be careful about, right? What if some of the data that you give your AI program was wrong? In this case, it seems like a silly example because the AI would just learn that something's a Yoda when it's actually not, and you know who cares? But think about a real life example. Think about a self-driving car and a self-driving car trying to learn the difference between a lamppost and a person. A lamppost is always gonna stay in the same place. Whereas well, a person can start walking, right? And if a self-driving car is driving along and it sees something that it thinks it's a lamppost and it's actually a person, and that person starts walking, all of a sudden you could get into some really catastrophic results. Or what if we only have a few examples of Yodas, right? And again, in this case, it's not that important, but think about a real life example. Think about if, um, you know, when Apple was building out its face unlock feature, face ID feature, they didn't have enough examples of dark skin faces. Now, all of a sudden, if you've got darker skin, you find it a lot harder to use that new, really powerful technology. Or finally, what if I just have a different idea from other people about what a schizzle is, right? You can think about this in a real context where take, uh, take Siri, for example, and let's say that I am building out the technology for Siri, but I have a really hard time figuring out what, uh, what a really figuring out what a person with an Australian accent is saying. And when that happens, if I hear an Australian accent, I might write out something that's completely wrong compared to what they actually say. Now, all of a sudden, the AI starts to learn my mistakes and starts to pick up my bad habits. And that's ultimately the lesson that we take away from this is that AI is really only as good as the data it learns from. And it's really, really important that we focus on having really good, high quality data. And we also have to understand that, you know, AI, like a lot of this bad data, it tends to happen by mistake. There's not people who are doing this on purpose. In fact, when engineers are building out AI, most of the time that they're building this out is spent on collecting as much representative data as they can and cleaning it and make sure, making sure that it is as accurate as possible. And with that, I'll pass it over to Mac to talk about building a better world with AI. Thanks, Janet. So now that we have learned what AI is, what it isn't, 
and how it learns, we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can use that knowledge to build a better world with AI. And to, to learn a little bit more about this, we're going to look at some examples of AI that are already being built and used today. And our first example here is that of self-driving vehicles. Uh, so in this GIF, we're seeing a self-driving truck navigate perfectly down the highway. Uh, and in order to do this, it's using a few different AI techniques. Uh, two of the bigger ones are image recognition and spatial awareness. And it uses both of these in combination to identify objects and people, other cars, lanes, and then navigate their surroundings accordingly. And so when we're talking about using these types of technologies in the real world, we have real world consequences. Uh, some real world consequences of self-driving cars are potentially getting places faster, more efficiently, uh, and doing so in a lot less time and saving lives by driving more carefully. But we also have some negative consequences. When we look at self-driving trucks specifically, uh, in America, we have something around 3 million truck drivers. And so if we were to implement self-driving trucks today, we have to consider where those 3 million people are going to go, uh, what, are the, what their other jobs can they do, and uh, how can we kind of navigate these unforeseen circumstances and potential consequences of these technologies. And so we're going to look at another example now that's not quite as straightforward. Uh, and this one is autonomous weapon systems. All right. And so in that little video, we saw a robot named Atlas perform some things that typically only humans could do. And this robot's made by a company named Boston Dynamics. And uh, this company builds robots that are capable of doing as many things as humans and more. So in that video, we saw that Atlas was able to jump, tumble, spin around, and do a lot of things that most humans can't even do. Uh, and this specific robot, Atlas, was originally designed as an autonomous weapon system. A lot of these types of technologies are originally built for uh, military purposes. Uh, and as a result, they have some pretty serious consequences. Uh, and so these autonomous weapon systems typically use two big AI technologies, again, uh, and that's image recognition and spatial awareness. And so it uses these in combination to be able to identify targets, navigate surroundings, and uh, be able to make decisions on the fly. Uh, and so this technology could be used for things like weapons, as we've mentioned, or it could be used uh, for some things that are slightly more positive, like search and rescue missions, or uh, assisting people to carry things. Um, and again, we're seeing this trend of an AI technology that isn't quite as straightforward as we might think, where it can have potentially good and bad consequences. And so we're gonna look at another example now that's not quite as controversial. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. All right, and so there we were able to see an Amazon product called Amazon Go. Uh, and Amazon Go is this store, as the video mentioned, that allows you to walk in and out without ever having to deal with any employee or cashier or anybody for that matter. Uh, all you have to do is show your phone, select the app, walk in, 
And using AI, the store is able to tell exactly who you are and everything that you're picking up or putting down. And then at the end of the uh, your time there, it's going to tell exactly what you walked out of the store with and charge you accordingly. Uh, and so it's using two major AI technologies, one being facial recognition and the other being classification. Uh, and so it's using facial recognition to look at your face and tell exactly who you are and then match you to an account in their database. And then it's using classification to tell exactly what objects you're picking up, putting down, or maybe even looking at a little bit more and might be curious about. Uh, and so this has some really, really interesting implications, especially today with something like COVID-19, where we're told that we need to be social distancing. Uh, and so if we were to have grocery stores that are outfitted with this technology, we could see some of these potential downfalls of being in a grocery store uh, start to go away. And we could potentially see people go in and out of a grocery store without ever having to worry about coming into contact with somebody who is carrying COVID. Um, and so here we're seeing potential amazing benefits in that you don't necessarily have to stop or waste time talking to people. Um, but again, we're also seeing another potential negative consequence in that we're replacing jobs at the end of the day and that we don't have cashiers in these stores or people walking around asking you if you need help. Uh, and so again, we need to make sure that we're balancing the good and the bad when we're implementing these technologies. Uh, and so let's take a look at one more little example. All right. And here we're looking at a surveillance feed of a street where we can see that the uh, AI system is identifying all the people or humans in this, in this uh, frame and where they're walking. Uh, and it's doing this using facial recognition and classification. So it's able to classify the objects in, in this video that we see. Uh, it's semantically segmenting or it's identifying and highlighting all the people in there. And then based on the facial recognition software, it's telling exactly who which person is. Uh, and so with this technology, we can see things like uh, more effective policing. Um, we can uh, help people that may not be able to call the police or uh, in certain scenarios where um, other people aren't around to help. The, the AI system could identify a person in need and automatically call the authorities or emergency services. Um, but on the flip side, this technology could also be used to identify, track, and potentially oppress individuals or entire populations. Um, and so when we're deploying these types of technologies at scale, we want to make sure that we're doing so with as little bias or negative consequences as possible. All right. And so now that we've looked at these four examples, we want to get a little bit of feedback from you guys. So let's go ahead and pull our phones out again, go to Slido. And uh, if you need to, enter the hashtag P593, and we'll see which of these uh, use cases that we've talked about that you're most comfortable with, whether it's the self-driving trucks, uh, the autonomous weapons, the Amazon Go stores, or the surveillance cameras. And I'll give you a couple more seconds to, to give us some feedback there. All right, a few more seconds, and let's see what you guys are uh, are telling us here. All right, and so it looks like you guys are big fans of the Amazon Go stores and the self-driving trucks. And this is to be expected because those are two of the examples that had the more obvious positive consequences of being used. Um, but it's also important to now distinguish that uh, when we look at the Amazon Go stores, and the surveillance cameras, they're using the same technology. And the self-driving trucks and the autonomous weapons are also using the same technology. Uh, and so when we want to have better self-driving trucks or self-driving cars that are going to get us from point A to point B a lot safer, we can't necessarily make those uh, jumps in technology without doing so in autonomous weapons as well. Um, and the same goes for the Amazon Go stores. If we want to have these stores where we don't have to deal with uh, cashiers or have to be too close to other people, we also have to have these incredibly advanced surveillance systems as well. So when we're looking at the positive use cases for AI, we need to be cognizant that some of these technologies are tied to other technologies and you can't have one without the other. And so now that we're a little bit more aware of how these technologies work, it's up to us, the AI experts, to promote the positive uses of AI in society, 
because using this, we know that we can make sure that everybody has a happier and healthier life and that no one gets left behind. And with that, I'm going to hand it back off to Salam to talk a little bit about COVID and AI. Thanks, Mac. So let's take these three major examples where AI is being used against COVID-19. We're talking about flow, severity, and spread. So when talking about flow, we're talking about the prioritization of patients, which patients need the most care and when, and where do we need to distribute the important resources? So using AI tools that are embedded into the EMR or electronic medical records, we're actually able to see which patients need care when. So when looking at severity, there are currently AI tools that are being researched that are actually able to identify which patients will actually move on to have severe respiratory problems. And currently these AI models are 80% accurate, but researchers are still trying to push that to be 90 and almost 100% accurate. And lastly, outbreaks. Currently, Blue Dot software was actually able to identify the outbreak in December on December 30th, when there were unusual pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China. And so even then, AI was being used to actually identify COVID-19 in its early stages. And Carnegie Mellon actually is retraining its AI models that were once used for seasonal flu to now be used against COVID-19. So I'll pass it off to Janid to talk about the learning objectives. Great. Thanks so much, Salam. So to sort of wrap up what we've talked about, we started this with three learning objectives. What is AI? How does it learn? And how can we build a better world? And we saw that AI is when computers use skills that normally need human intelligence. How does it learn? Well, it learns through repetition and needs lots of really, really good unbiased data. And finally, how can we build a better world with AI? Well, it's up to us to understand that AI is a tool that can create both positive and negative outcomes. And we need to have conversations about these positive and negative outcomes. And we as a society decide what guardrails are we going to put in place so that AI does more of the positive and less of the negative. And with that, I will bring back Haroon and pass it off to him. All right, thanks, Sinead. Thanks, Mac, and thanks, Salam, for going through the presentation. We hope you all enjoyed it. Um, don't worry if you think you forgot anything over the course of the presentation. We're going to be sending everyone that signed up on Eventbrite a copy of the presentation, as well as a bunch of other resources. I'll talk a little bit more about this after the Q&A section. Um, so now we're going to have our Q&A section, where Hamza is going to moderate the answering of two or three questions. So feel free to ask your questions in the chat. We're gonna select two or three of the best questions and then Janid and Mac are gonna answer them. And while you do that, I wanna talk a little bit about a giveaway that AI for Anyone is sponsoring here. So I'm gonna pull up some details. So we are giving away three Google AIY vision kits and we're giving away three kits. You can enter twice, once on Instagram, once on Twitter. Uh, the instructions are very simple. You follow us and then you follow Mark Cuban AI on either platform, you like our latest post and you share our latest story on Instagram or you retweet our latest pin tweet on Twitter. Uh, these kits are really great. They're a great way to spend your time in quarantine. You'll have the opportunity to actually build a computer vision enabled camera, uh, which is really great. It's gonna be able to identify whatever objects is looking at. And uh, it's just a great way to learn AI for people of all ages. So make sure you apply. There's more information in the description below. So make sure you check those links out. All right, so I think we might have some questions in. So I'm gonna pull up Hamza here. And uh, Hamza, take it away with the Q&A section. Awesome. Thank you, Haroon. And thank you for everyone for joining and sending in your great questions. I'm going to add Mac and Janae back to the stream so they can help us tackle some of these great questions. Um, just as a quick disclaimer, we're not going to get too technical on this call just to be inclusive. So if you want to learn more about AI, please feel free to go, go to AIforanyone.org slash learn. Um, and there's a lot of resources listed out there um, if you feel uh, like you want to get uh, deeper into some of the technical concepts. Uh, Janae, the Mac, great job on the presentation. Uh, we have some good questions lined up, so let's dig right into it. 
First question, are driverless cars actually safer? A lot of people seem to think that humans are able to make decisions that um, computers can't make, uh, dynamic decisions. So this was a polarizing topic. Um, what are your, what's your take on this? Um, I'll jump in first. I know Jeanette and I share a, a lot of views on this topic. Um, and right off the bat, yes, uh, driverless vehicles are safer uh, and better at driving than human beings. Um, computers don't get tired. Uh, they don't get distracted. Um, the average self-driving car is going to have significantly more sensors and cameras uh, and can see in every direction while humans can only see in one. Um, there's a lot of limitations that humans have that computers simply don't. Um, and on top of that, all of these uh, self-driving cars are sharing their data with each other. And as one car gets better, every other car gets better too. And that's just an advantage that we can't really compete with at the end of the day. Yeah, to sort of like very easily summarize it for most people, um, at the end of the day, as humans, we've got two eyes, or as computers have can have as many eyes as we put all around the car. Um, a computer is not going to need a backup camera because it's already got a sensor back there. Um, and they're also able to react and make decisions much, much faster than we are. Um, and I think the point that really drives this home for, for me as well is that they can practice way more than we can, right? If you were to imagine that you're able to drive for 100,000 hours, you probably become a much better driver. But where are you going to find the time to drive for 100,000 hours? Compare that to a computer, right? It can just go 24-7 and keep practicing and keep learning. Um, in most situations already, um, driverless cars are getting to be safer. There's still definitely a ways to go before we move completely to that. But um, there's a lot of promise. Gotcha. Yeah, I think another important point here is that the right decision is really a gray area. Um, so mo for most people, the right decision is I'm going to save myself. Uh, but let's think of a scenario where I'm driving down the road and in order to save myself, I have to run over pedestrians. Now, in that scenario for us, the right decision might be to save ourselves. But, you know, that's that's where it becomes gray. And um, society might deem it, you know, inappropriate for you to save yourself at the cost of more lives. Um, next question is, which industries will get disrupted the most by AI? Any, any predictions or thoughts around this? I know it's difficult to pinpoint specific industries. So we have talked about a few of them already, right? We talked about, uh, we talked about drivers. Uh, we talked about cashiers. Typically, a lot of industries that require people, um, usually, unfortunately, lower, uh, lower paying jobs, minimum wage jobs, those jobs that can be automated, um, very likely could be automated. Um, think about even the people who are giving information to you. These are things like uh, people at information desks or even just helpers in a store. Um, right now, when you're at home, you might have a Google device that you ask questions to and it's able to answer so many of your questions. Those things could be deployed in stores very easily. Um, so a lot of these like much um, lower skilled jobs or things that can be automated are the ones that are going to be lost. And that's why it's even more important for us to be conscious and be thinking about that, right? Um, which is we want to make sure that we're bringing those people along, that we're not just leaving them behind, that the benefits of the technology are being used to also retrain some of those people and get them up to speed about how they can take advantage of the technology and also how they can set themselves up so that they're not losing their livelihood, which is part of why you know we do this um, at AI for Anyone. That's exactly right. Uh, and just to piggyback off that a little bit, um, I think uh, one of the easy answers is every industry. At the end of the day, there isn't an industry out there that won't be touched by AI. Um, and there are obvious, obviously ones that are going to be uh, hit a little harder. Um, but it's not just low skill uh, or repetitive uh, jobs that are going to be replaced or uh, changed. Uh, you have jobs like lawyers that are uh, actively being replaced right now uh, with some of these um, AI technologies. Uh, even doctors, uh, radiologists, uh, as uh, Salam talked about a little bit with COVID, um, we see these AI systems being trained to do exactly what a radiologist does and identify and um, look at a lot of different medical images. Um, so it, it isn't a matter of which industries is going to hit the hardest. It's when and uh, how hard, you know, is, is each one going to get hit? Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I love that Janet touched on uh, our mission uh, there. I think a big part of, you know, AI for Anyone is making sure that since this, this field is so gray, we give as many people a fundamental understanding of the technology so that we can have discussions because there's never a right or wrong answer. Um, especially when it comes to the industries, uh, I think a couple of misconceptions around that are, you know, AI is going to cause a lot of unemployment. 
Um, but even even that argument alone, you know, um, is, it, it doesn't have that much uh, empirical evidence behind it. Um, and, and we don't know sort of like the real effect that it's going to have. Um, but one thing that we do know is that the negative consequences are going to be more concentrated. If you have a, na a town full of drivers, there's going to be a lot of job loss maybe uh, in that uh, sort of neighborhood or community. Uh, but there might be thousands of jobs created due to that technology. So uh, it's always something that we have to balance and just be really aware of. Moving on, uh, any any comments Actually, on that? Actually, yeah, um, just to sort of add on to that, uh, one thing that I do like to remind people of is that, you know, this is not the first time that uh, we as humanity are going to face this. We have faced these types of re revolutions and changes in our work life before. Um, I think the most striking example is computers, right? We all have these computers, big and small now, in our homes. Whereas when they first came out, there were these giant things that lived only for corporations. But that advent of laptops in your homes completely changed how we do so much. Um, just think about the fact that there's a lot of people who are able to do their work at home today mostly because they have a computer and an internet connection. All of those jobs are likely only possible because you have that computer, right? Um, those jobs may not even have existed. Um, you think about um, the example that I thought uh, that I've heard before that's been really interesting is bookkeepers, right? Before we had laptops, there were a lot more bookkeepers. Every store needed to be keeping their books. Now all that stuff is completely automated. Your point of sale system takes care of it. Um, but we're certainly not looking back now thinking, oh no, we lost the bookkeepers, right? We found new jobs for them and new skills for them. I do miss the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> um, Mac, I'll let you answer this one. Um, since you touched on the Amazon Go stores, what if you need help in that store? How do you get help if there's no human there? Oh, you're completely out of luck. No, I'm just kidding. Um, they do have they do have a, a lot of different options there. Um, one of which is going to be the app that you're gonna be using. Um, so if you walk into the Amazon Go store, you're also going to have access to things like Alexa, right? Um, which is another AI system that you can then, you know, interact with and get the answers that you need. Um, but beyond that, it's uh, like we've been talking about right here. It's not necessarily about completely replacing these jobs or compl completely replacing cashiers, uh, but allowing the AI to work alongside us and make us better. Um, so in these stores, there are still going to be people potentially in the background, uh, making sure that the system's working, uh, making sure that nothing goes wrong, um, but also being there for us if we really do need that help or if, you know, if you have a really pressing question that can't be answered by Alexa. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not quite as black and white. Gotcha. And uh, just to close things off, I know we have a lot of students on the line today, especially high school students. And you know, I remember when I was in high school, I didn't really have an interest in going into computer science or anything super technical. Uh, and for those students, what, what do you, uh, what advice do you have for them to best prepare them for this? They might be intimidated by AI. They might say, I don't want to be a programmer. I don't want to go into a field like that. Is this relevant to me? Um, since it will impact them, what, what advice would you give them? Um, I guess I can get started on this one. Um, so I definitely don't think you need to be building AI technology in order to be part of this industry. There is a lot to do within here, um, things that we don't even know, right? Um, you think about when the, the internet first came out, right? That was something that completely revolutionized how we do everything. But just because there's the internet doesn't mean that everyone's building the internet. We're all working within it and using it in our jobs and trying to understand it. Um, one example that I like to think of a lot is um, especially when it comes to AI, we're going to need a lot more people in the humanities to be thinking about the really, really hard questions. We touched on driverless cars earlier, right? There's this um, very simple example that actually a student at a workshop brought up once when we were delivering it in person. And she put up her hand and she asked, um, what happens when a driverless car gets into an accident with a person who is driving the car themselves? Who's going to be at fault? Is it the driverless car? Is it the person who owns the driverless car? Is it the human? Is it the person who built the driverless car? Is it the person who wrote the software that the driverless car runs on? Um, there's a lot of complicated questions to answer when it comes to implementing AI. And the people in the humanities are the ones who are gonna be best equipped to help us as a society answer those questions. Totally, and even, even in that example, uh, the actuaries and sort of the finance folks at the insurance companies are gonna have to deal with the risk of um, you know, having driverless cars get into accidents. So. 
Uh, that's a really good example. Any closing comments, Mac? I uh, couldn't agree with you more there. Um, I think that uh, giving advice to anybody in high school right now, um, AI is going to affect your life one way or the other. Um, so the way I look at it, you might as well have a say in what that looks like, right? Um, and the other thing is uh, AI jobs are in demand. So if you are in more of you know the technical side of things or you do have a really big interest in computers or in programming, um, follow our resources, reach out to us, and we will make sure that we give you exactly what you need to get where you want to go and help make the world a better place with AI, um, because it's certainly possible. Uh, and it doesn't pay too bad either. Uh, so these are all things to consider and keep in mind um, when we're talking about AI and, and how we want to shape that future. Awesome. Thank you both so much. This was super helpful. I'm going to hand it back off to Haroon to close things out. All right. Thanks, Hamza. Thanks, Mac. And thanks, Sinead. That was really informative. We really appreciate you all doing that. Um, so that does it for our program today. But the conversation doesn't end tonight. Uh, we can continue the conversation. You can continue the conversation, rather, uh, by following AI for Anyone and Mark Cuban AI on social media. Um, all of us manage our social media accounts, so it's a very easy way to get in touch with us. If you have any questions, any concerns, or if you would like to get involved, with what we're working on, please feel free to check us out. I just got noticed a little bit earlier that AIforanyone.org is down. So, uh, you know, I, I guess that's a good problem to have because a lot of you are uh, trying to check out the website right now. Uh, so we'll let you know when that's back up. But in the meantime, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, just about every single social media platform out there. Um, also, very quickly, before we hop off, I want to talk to you a little bit about the resources that we're going to be sending you. So everyone that signed up on Eventbrite, I think we had a total of 50,000 uh, plus people that, that registered. We're going to be sending you all a few resources. And for AI for Anyone, we're going to be sending you a bunch of resources on how to volunteer for us, how to learn more about AI, some of our favorite learn, uh, res or learning resources for learning more. Uh, and we're also giving away our toolkit. Now, the toolkit is a great way for educators or anyone that's interested in teaching AI to really just get a full walkthrough of how they can go and teach the concepts on their own. The toolkit includes the slides that you saw today, as well as scripts and additional resources to learn more. You don't need to know much about AI in order to teach AI, and that's exactly what the toolkit uh, allows you to do. And we'll send you a bunch more resources that, that we like. Um, also on Mark, Mark Cuban Foundations, and we're going to be providing more information about Mark Cuban Foundations free AI bootcamp. Uh, you can check it out at markcubanai.org. Uh, click the I want to attend a bootcamp button, leave some information about yourself, and they'll be sure to let you know when the program comes to a city near you. Uh, so these boot camps are really great. They've been running for the last couple of years, and they're coming, uh, expanding to more cities. So make sure you sign up, and then you get more information about when the boot camps come to a city near you. Um, I think that's about it. So I'm going to put our team up here, and uh, we can uh, all say goodbye to you uh, for the rest of the, rest of the night. And uh, Keep on learning about AI. Let us know if you have any questions. Follow us on social media, and we hope you enjoyed. Thank you.